All right, so Halloween Horror Nights 32 is officially here. We're a few weeks into the event, almost a month now, and I wanted to make this little sit down video talking about my in depth opinions about the event this year because there's a lot going on with the event super heavy hitter IPs, a brand new event icon, some great originals that represent Universal's history, Halloween Horror Nights history. So, that being said, this video is going to contain spoilers. I'm going to be going into each of the Haunted Houses, the Scare Zones too, but specifically the Haunted Houses um, of Halloween Horror Nights 32 and talking about them in depth. So if you don't want any spoilers, I'd suggest not watching this one. Also, these are just my opinions based on those initial run-throughs. I'm not going to rank the houses in this video. I want to do that at the end of the season. Anyways, we got 10 Haunted Houses, 5 Scare Zones I want to talk about, so I don't waste no more time and just hop right into them. Now, when it comes to Haunted Houses, I guess the best place to start would be your marquee attractions, your IPs. And obviously, the the biggest IP this year is Stranger Things. This of course is going to follow the fourth season of the show and really harp on those big moments from the series, mostly from the second half to the end of the series, um, really that last episode especially. Uh, those are the big moments we're seeing here. I really, really love the opening scene with Eddie's trailer. I really wish there was a title card. You do sort of hear the theme and see the red light as you walk up to Eddie's trailer, but I would have really loved the moment that says Stranger Things like they had back in 2019 and 2018. Stranger Things as a house series is really good at sort of having those great cold opens and I think this one was really really strong. I really love the moments with 1 and 11. I think they were executed really really well here. A scare that caught me off guard kind of having 11 on one side, 1 on the other side and kind of the smoke blowing in the air. I think it was a really great moment and I think that's my biggest thing with this house. The smaller scale more like one on one scenes like the 11 and 1 moment. Like the moment later with Steve in the trailer. Like the moment with Lucas and Max and Jason at the end. Those smaller scale moments I think are really, really detailed, while the bigger moments like Vecna's Mind Lair and the Master of Puppets scene, as cool as it is, feel a little more lackluster because they don't really have the room to create these super detailed sets. They're really leaning on things like projections to create that scale, which again is totally understandable, but it does kind of take me out of it personally. Despite this though, I think I had a pretty good time with the Stranger Things house this year. And I think this house is a good house to start with and put you in the vibe of Stranger Things and Halloween Horror Nights. It's one that you're going to want to see. Now moving from one sort of tentpole IP to another, let's talk about The Last of Us on the complete opposite side of the park. I think where The Last of Us shines is its very, very detailed set pieces. They are pulling locations and direct nods from the game bringing the game to life, which makes me really excited for the Unmasking the Horror tour. I'm going to be doing the three house tour as well as the six house tour. I'm really, really excited uh, to see this with the lights on and get sort of the details and get a better look at it. But I think the sets here are absolutely fantastic. Really large scale sets really makes use of that parade building location. You also have a good amount of character variety, and I feel like every sort of character type gets a moment in here. Of course, you have lots of hunters, you have lots of runners, you have a good amount of clickers, and you really only have a couple bloaters, but the bloaters Loader moments are absolutely fantastic. There are a couple houses this year that do this, but this is a house that builds as it goes on. You're seeing a lot of humans initially, but as you go deeper into the haunted house, you start to see more infected landscapes and more of the infected themselves. Like I said, those infected moments were standouts, fantastic costume design, fantastic sound design. My only real critique is something that I've heard a lot of people say, and I just wish we had more Joel and Ellie. Uh, again, like the infected, the moments we have with Joel and Ellie are great. I love them. They're so fun but I just wish we had a little bit more of them. But otherwise, a very, very solid house, especially a solid IP house, brings the property to life in the best way possible, and that's really all you can ask for IP houses. Now, moving from a very beloved IP at this year's event to one that's gotten a lot of controversy, let's talk about Chucky Ultimate Kill Count. I think this house is extremely, extremely overhated. And I hear where the criticisms are coming from. Lots of screens, kind of minimal set work, as well as a story that's really, really a meta take that they really didn't have to go with. They could have just done a straight up adaptation of the sci-fi series. However, I really enjoy this house because of what it does with Chucky's character. This is not a house about a specific Chucky film or even the Chucky series it's just about Chucky himself and making a story like this executing it in the way they did with the sort of space they had because remember we are in Fast and Furious I still think they created a house that fit into the darkly funny spirit of our favorite killer doll 
Surprisingly for me, there are a lot of unique scares and fun tricks that celebrate the history of Chucky kills. You're not just getting stuff from the sci-fi series, you're getting a couple kills from the past movies, which is really fun. And like I said, there are a lot of unique scares, unique effects involving lots of puppets, which I think is really cool. I really love that opening scene with the Chucky that sits right there and sort of talks to you as you walk by. There's not really a big scare in that scene. I guess there is a scare, but it's not like a crazy big scare moment. It's more just to get you kind of warmed up into the fun vibe here. And I also love how that opening scene ties into the pre-show, which features recorded footage for the haunted house. As a Halloween Horror Nights nerd, I absolutely love that they made special Chucky footage for this haunted house. And I love even more that it ties into the story set up by the pre-show, having this sort of universal executive walking through the haunted house, then to see him dead on the floor the second you walk in kind of ties into that meta feel that this house carries. I also personally like how this house is laid out. I know it might be a little strange to people, especially considering the location and the fact that you have that natural break in between. But the the first half is more related to the films, mostly Child's Play 2, but of course some stuff involving Tiffany and things like that. So tying back into the legacy of Chucky, while the second half is Chucky's Haunted House with more kills from the series, I feel like it might take a couple run-throughs to get that. So I could see where that might not be too great for some people, but it really worked for me. And honestly, while it seems like it's all over the place, I had a lot of fun with this house. I think this is another great house to start with if you have any sort of interest in Chucky, whether it's from the past films or from, you know, the new sci-fi series, I think you can have a lot of fun if you sort of keep an open mind, take it for what it is rather than what people say it is online. Now, moving from the most fun house to probably the scariest house of this year, if I'm being honest, let's talk about The Exorcist Believer. I love the fact that even though we haven't seen the movie yet, it felt like there was enough to hold this haunted house. They really utilize some of the set pieces that we know from the trailers and adding some cool creative interpretations in order to fill this space, which is holding its own soundstage, which is pretty impressive. This has possibly my favorite facade slash opening scene of the year, going through the Haitian market and then seeing the doll as the exorcist theme plays in the background and you're getting that smell of like earthy, dirt, stinky, whatever. It really sets up the atmosphere that you're going into. It's very foreboding. I also love how the story flows and how it builds. It's another one of those building haunted houses that doesn't start out super scary. There are a few moments where there are no scares, but then once the scares come, they come at you. The sets here are really, really fleshed out, and I also really love how they change, especially the exorcism room, which we see twice in two different contexts. I also really love how the sets work with the scares, and there are a lot of different types of scares in this haunted house. You have these very aggressive boo holes, you have scrim, and then you have the chair scare, which is probably going to be one of the most memorable scares this year. And as I alluded to earlier, yes, it is true. The smell in this house is absolutely terrible, but truly adds to the immersion. Overall, if you couldn't tell, this was the house that scared me the most this year and makes me more excited to see the film. And like The Last of Us is a really, really strong IP house just all around. So Exorcist Believer gets a thumbs up from me. However, the last IP is by far my favorite IP this year, and that is Universal Monsters Unmasked. From the second I walked through the doors and into the facade, I was grinning ear to ear. I loved this house so much. One of my biggest criticisms, or I guess things that I wasn't the biggest fan of with Legends Collide last year was how it felt like just a mummy house with the other guys kind of there. Of course, they had some good moments, but the sets and a lot of the scares were very, very mummy heavy. And while this house is very phantom heavy, each monster gets a big moment, and I feel like each monster also gets a big set piece too. I'm thinking of the Phantom's fantastic musical cues in the Opera House, the Invisible Man Blacklight Room, Mr. Hyde's Court yard and the incredible jaw-dropping hunchback bungee scare. I feel like these moments, as well as the other moments that fill out the house, are all kind of catered to each of the characters' personalities. You're not just getting the same scares from everybody, you get these really aggressive scares from Mr. Hyde, you're having these sort of misdirect scares from the Invisible Man, these very theatrical scares from the Phantom of the Opera, and these very like in-your-face scares from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. The sets are absolutely beautiful with lots of variety and size and scale. You have tight hallways and you also have these huge open courtyards that really reflect the streets of Paris. I know they talked about this being
being in the catacombs and I didn't really get the catacombs in this version that was more reflected in Hollywood's version but I did get the idea of going to the streets of Paris which I personally prefer a lot more and again it felt like it was a setting that all of these monsters would likely exist in it doesn't feel like last year where the mummy felt like he was dominating the whole house set wise even though those sets were gorgeous too it feels like something completely unique and I absolutely love it I think it's a great addition to the Universal Monsters catalog for Halloween Horror Nights and shows love to those underappreciated monsters that we love so much. Now, while I think we had a pretty solid slate of IPs this year, I think the originals were really the standout houses of this year's event. And talking about originals, we have to talk about our icon, Dr. Oddfellow, and his icon house, Dr. Oddfellow's Twisted Origins. On the surface, the facade is pretty simple looking, but you have lots of great Easter eggs to Jack and just Oddfellow's Carnival, lots of little props and stuff around to look at. And I love how this house kind of conveys the more seedy carnival vibe rather than something more wild and fantastical that we've seen in years past. But what they do that I really, really love is they take the carnival graveyard idea and they make it really, really tight. They make the use of the tent. They have these big scenes. You have a couple big scenes with Oddfellow and then you have another big scene in the middle with a sort of theater attraction. But the rest of the house is really tight hallways. You're going from like the makeup room to sort of animal cages and just uh, tight hallways with lots of curtains in your face. I think it really makes use of that tent location. I really couldn't imagine this house being placed anywhere else with the same level of success. You never know what's coming from what angle. It's a lot of boo holes and things like that, but they're coming from the top, from the side, from the other side, misdirects here and there. You don't know what's happening and it adds to that sort of twisted feel. So kind of disorienting feel, but not overly gimmicky with that. Lots and lots of Oddfellow here, which I mean, you would expect because he's literally in the name of the house. He plays the perfect role in here, sort of the curator of these horrors, of these oddities that are coming after you to kill you. This story gives context to the night where Jack dies and adds to it and creates the atmosphere, sets the scene for this moment, this infamous moment in Halloween Horror Nights history where Dr. Oddfellow kills Jack. You see him stuffing him into the box, which is really, really great detail. Lots and lots of Easter eggs. Another house I'm super excited to see on the Unmasking the Horror Tour, and overall from opening night has been one of my favorite houses of the entire year. However, now I think it's the perfect time to jump over to its neighbor, The Darkest Deal, which was way, way better than I ever could have anticipated. This house is fantastic, but I think the biggest success with it is with its storytelling and how it brings the story of Pine Straw Spruce that we've learned from the podcast and from the other Dream Park Productions video, Wink Wink in the Cards, brings that story to life with really atmospheric sets and a great smell, my favorite smell of the year. This house also has really great sound design with so many great sound effects and quotable lines. I think this is, for me, the most quotable house from this year. I hear myself saying the deal is done way more times than I would like to admit. And to go with that, you also have these great costume designs for these characters and creatures. The collector has a really, really cool design. You have this sort of sowing goat creature. You have these strange, almost like zombie type of characters that are listening to Pine Straw Spruce. I think it's really cool. I think the atmosphere by the sets, by the sounds, by the characters is really brought to life. However, it's not just the story that's super strong here. There's also some fantastic scares. I think other than Exorcist, this is the most aggressive house when it comes to scares all throughout, but this house also builds as you go on. It doesn't start out super scary. You don't get a whole lot of super aggressive scares, but as you go deeper, sort of feel the corruption of the collector and end up in the collector's lair, you just get attacked from all sides. You have ghillie suits, you have these aggressive boo hole scares, and it's just really great. It's nothing super revolutionary when it comes to scares, but I think they really really works. Some houses only run on atmosphere alone, but this one combines scares and story in a way perfect for HHN and is really maybe my favorite house this year so far. Now moving from one vibe based house to another, I want to talk about Dueling Dragons Choose Thy Fate, which is a really, really unique one. It's a unique vibe for the event. And out of all the houses, this is the one that I think you need to do multiple times to take in all the effects and the scenery. There are so many dynamic set pieces 
in here. Even some that directly reference the original Dueling Dragons ride. You have this sort of entrance to the castle portion of the Dueling Dragons queue in a room. You have rooms themed to the Blizzrock and Pyrox sections of the Blizzrock. One is one of my favorite rooms of the entire house. And of course, you have this really dramatic facade with the dragons that really shows the set dressing skills of Halloween Horror Night. Shows you why Halloween Horror Nights, especially here in Orlando, is at the top of the game when it comes to high quality haunted house set dressing. However, this isn't even just the big, big stuff. Even the small effects really showcase this. I think this house did so many interesting things, especially with the lighting. There's a moment where sort of the lighting sort of pulsates through the wall. You have the moment with the spell book. And of course, just the various lighting throughout. It's just really, really great lighting wise. The scares are more minimal here, but when they get you, they get you. Like I've had some really, really great scares. Some of the best scares of the year in this house, uh, but there'll be maybe Maybe one or two scares through a run through. It's not like a Darkest Deal or Exorcist where they're getting you boom, boom, boom from all sides in most cases. There are lots of fun characters that really expand on the lore. You get to see the armies of both Blizzrock and Pyrock. You're getting to see trolls and fairies and also some new looks at the warlocks, Blizzrock and Pyrock. You're not getting a whole lot of dragons here, unfortunately, um, but you're getting, again, many, many moments with the warlocks. They are the central characters of this haunted house. The choose your fate element, while sort of minimal, is really fun and encourages sort of redoing this house, as I mentioned before, to get all four possible endings. For me, I think this is the big scenic house of the year. I know some people are gonna disagree with me, but I think this one's strengths lie in its scenic and set design. And I think if you're a big fan of high fantasy or the original Dueling Dragons attraction at Islands of Adventure, you're going to be a big fan of this house. You're gonna get the Easter eggs, get the references, and just feel the vibe. And that, in that way, it's a completely different vibe because I don't know the last time we've seen dragons and wizards in a haunted house. Now, moving from something crazy, risky, and new to something a little more familiar to Halloween Horror Nights fans, let's talk about Yeti. While it's nothing all that new, it is a fun twist on a more recent fan favorite. Of course, this is a sequel to the 2019 Yeti Terror of the Yukon House, and I really love how they switch things up here with this new campground atmosphere. At first, I wasn't a big fan of it. I just eh, wasn't really too on it, but as I sort of thought about it more and done this house, I really do enjoy how they utilize the woods and the campsites and all that stuff for really, really fun moments and fun scares. I feel like they turned the camp up a little more for this house. Uh, it has the same sort of dark humor as the original. I wouldn't say it's like the comedy house, but there is a lot of camp in here. And that sort of comes from these sort of hillbilly human characters that are really fun, give some really funny lines. And of course, the return of our fan favorite, Lord and Savior, H.H. and Bear. It was so great to see them back in this house, and I think it made sense for the setting. I should have seen this coming, honestly. And while this one didn't blow my mind or anything, there was a lot of fun to be had in here and I think this setting allows for really really great atmosphere and scares. Now I've saved what I think is the fan favorite from this year for last Blood Moon Dark Offerings. Right off the bat, the sets are incredibly detailed and beautiful. There's a reason why this house keeps getting compared to Dead Men's Pier, Winter's Wake. It's just because of these fantastic sets. I love how the town of Parish Town feels very centralized and connected. It doesn't feel like you're in a soundstage going through a haunted house. It feels like you're in this colonial village. Well, initially I was a little thrown off by the house just being soaked in red light. I think it does a lot for the story story and for the atmosphere, it allows for lots of shadows. Like monsters though, there are a mix of bigger and smaller scale sets. You have those sort of courtyard moments, but then you also have where you go inside of the buildings, which I think is really, really cool as someone who's a big history nerd. While it's hard to make direct connections to the backstory, I feel like this is the most disconnected from any of the backstories that we've seen leading up to the event. There is a really intense vibe here. It feels like you're not supposed to be here. You shouldn't be here. It's not really fun to be here. And I think really more than any of the houses, this house does just build in that intensity and in that ferocity between the characters with the sounds. You're hearing the bell going off in the bell tower and the music's getting more intense and you hear the chanting. This isn't some kind of supernatural story with a big scary monster or no big reveal at the end. 
these are just people and I think that mixed with sort of the natural lighting and the realistic sort of set pieces makes this a very spooky traditional Halloween feeling house. However, HHN isn't all about the haunted houses and I think this year we also had a really good lineup of scare zones as well. I don't think as strong as last year's lineup of scare zones personally, uh, but there are some definite standouts here and I think with scare zones we must start at the front of the park with Dr. Oddfellow's collection of horror. This is your table of content scare zone, it's nothing crazy, but having Dr. Oddfellow there to tie it all together really makes this one of my favorite scare zones to just hang out in this year. The Oddfellow shows are top tier, I love watching him just come on the stage and roast people on their zodiac signs or just interact with people. I love how he's just kind of roaming around. He's not behind a wall, he's not up so high that you can't really interact with him, you can't get that personal time with him. It it truly feels like an icon's scare zone. And this might be a hot or cold take, depending on who you ask, but I think the scare zone is way way better in this location than in the Minion Land Illumination Avenue location. There's more room for actors and guests to roam. There's room for a large stage over there on the corner. You have just more room in general. I feel like this scare zone feels more open than the other ones, even though the space is technically smaller. And I think it does a great job to lead into the next scare zone, which is the next one I'm going to talk about, Dark Zodiac. This scare zone easily wins for some of the coolest character designs this year, bar none. I think it's really fun to sort of walk through the scare zone and point out your zodiac sign and say, hey, this is the Leo character, here's the Scorpio character, here's the Capricorn character, aka the coolest one. There are a few show moments with Pisces and Aries that I think are really fun to just sort of stand and watch. And this is also going to be your chainsaw scare zone, and I like that they added that to add to this. This isn't a crazy set scare zone, this is more just kind of the characters roaming around and I personally didn't get scared at all in this scare zone so far but I think it's great to sort of hang out again watch the characters do their thing watch these zodiac signs sort of interact in ways that are consistent with the personality of the zodiac sign which is really cool and it's just a zone that's grown on me and will likely continue to grow on me. I know this one's kind of a disappointment for some people, but for me, I do enjoy it. However, the next scare zone, oh boy, we got a lot to talk about with Jungle of Doom, Expedition Horror. This was my most hyped, and this one, oh boy, this one delivered. The sets look great during the day as I showed in the updates, but they really come alive at night. The whole scare zone comes alive at night. There's so many great lighting effects that coordinate with the story moment with Oddfellow sort of grabbing the skull at the front. I absolutely love this as someone who's big into the lore and really wanted the lore to be represented at the event this year. I love that we have this moment with Dr. Oddfellow, you know, picking up the skull and now they've added narration, but him sort of laughing my as the bat eyes in the trees turn green, the tiki torches flicker on and off. I love how kinetic this scare zone feels and how directly connected it is to Dr. Oddfellow. It's just absolutely fantastic. Moving to Shipyard 32 Horror Unhinged, this was a scare zone that I was a little bit curious about, but I will say this scare zone creates a very, very eerie vibe. I love seeing the throwback characters, I love how they interact with the sets, most notably the fairy and Nosferatu's in the cages, and the Skulder Kray, definitely my favorite character from the scare zone. The one thing I will say is I wish there was more of a direct connection to Oddfellow, but I think it's a cool enough scare zone for San Francisco. And finally, let's talk about Vamp 69 Summer of Blood. This is the fun zone of this year and another great entry into the Vamp series. At first, I wasn't really feeling it, I'm going to be honest, but as I spent time and got to learn the characters, I began to truly love it. It carries that organic energy from previous vamp zones with the dancing and the vamp interactions, the hand signals and stuff like that. It's absolutely awesome. And it felt like a great continuation of the stuff set up by the other vamp scare zones, but also Sweet Revenge last year. I feel like a lot of Sweet's Revenge energy coming from Vamp 69, and I think it's exactly everything I wanted out of this scare zone. All right, and those are sort of my thoughts on Halloween Horror Nights this year year. I'd have to say as far as current favorites go, I kind of said it in the video, but for sure Universal Monsters Unmasked. What a fantastic 
House, uh, The Darkest Deal as well, and Dr. Oddfellow's Twisted Origins. I'd say those are my top three as of this moment, and uh, which one's number one? Well, they just keep shuffling around every time I go through them. Overall, a really strong year for Halloween Horror Nights. I think all of the houses and all the scare zones have things to love about them. I do have some minor critiques, as I kind of said in the video, but they're more minor stuff. They're more personal stuff to me. I can't wait to go to the event more, experience this stuff more over the next few weeks, the next month or so, and maybe even see some of you all in the fog. I know some of you guys have come up to me in the parks, which I really, really appreciate. I want to say, I just love, love, love meeting you all. So if you see me in the fog, come up. I don't bite. Of course, if you like HHN themed deep dives, history, stories, lore, vlogs from the event, and just universal stuff in general, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel, of course. Let me know what you think about the entries at Halloween Horror Nights 32. Have you been to Halloween Horror Nights 32? What was your favorite stuff? What do you think about anything? Just everything Halloween Horror Nights 32. Any thoughts you have, leave it down in the comments below. I really, really want to hear them. I want to thank you all for being so patient with me with the videos. I've been really, really busy in my personal life. A lot of stuff has been going on. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. More videos are coming. Um, I have a few big things when it comes to Horror Nights coming up soon in the next couple weeks that I'm really, really excited to show off and do videos for. But I guess you're going to have to wait until then. I want to thank you all for watching this video, of course, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care, everybody.